And we're live at 1.35 on, with Dr. Chris Fusterhausen from the Research Clinic, Peptides and Age Management. Welcome, Dr. Chris. Hi, Steve. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm excellent. How's your week been going? Uh, it's been busy, but good. A um, little uptick of COVID in our area, uh, seeing a little bit more of it, or at least in our practice, we've been seeing a little bit more, but um, weather's good. It's going to be in the night. Well, you probably will be too, but I can't mm -hmm. believe it's going to be like 95 Sunday. I hope this is it. I'm ready for a little cooler weather. You're ready for a change? I am. I'm not ready for the time change though. That's always the worst part of this time of year, in my opinion. So usually around the time change, part of the year is when we start seeing flus and colds and uh, allergies and things going on. And so today we wanted to talk about aging and how it impacts your immune system. And then what are some of the things that we can do, including peptides, to really boost, boost our immune system? Yeah, you know, that's such a vast topic. I completely agree with you. I mean, it's... Um such an important thing to age properly and keep our immune system uh, working uh, as functional as possible. So what, um, first of all, help us, you know, as we're getting older, we're knowing that, you know, I see, I, my, I get a little stuffy and I've never really had allergies, but I notice it at certain times I start to get stuffy. And so I think as we age, things change. What's happening when, when we're starting to um, experience things that we haven't really been part of um, normal life before? Well, a few different things can be happening, but you know, uh, first of all, as we experience allergens over and over, we can start to get more sensitive to those allergens. Um, and certainly we have different allergy seasons. If the weather, uh, like if it's hotter for an extended period of time, things die. But if it's cooler and more wet, then a lot of things bloom and that can play a big role in it. But so much of it is related to our immune system. Um, you know, as we age, our immune system isn't, for most of us, uh, is not nearly as as functional as it was when we were younger. And as we get older, uh, our T cells and B cells and macrophages, those cells that we produce in order to, um, you know, have an immune system, a proper immune system starts to wane. And that's why some of the things we're going to talk about today is really important, not only to try and make more of these uh, immune cells, but also making sure that the ones that we have are as functional as possible. So the common theme that we're going to notice as we go through these conversations, the healthy, the more healthy our cells, the better we're, we're set up to fight the things that we encounter in, in our environment. No. Nope. Yeah, and I, I heard it said this way. Actually, I was I was telling you earlier. I uh, listen to a lot of other podcasts myself uh, on these different topics. I like to get everybody's perspective, and we're trying to make healthy cells communicate better with other healthy cells, or at least nearly healthy cells. But we're also trying to even make what we maybe term sick cells function better and have all cells communicating in a more proper manner. And the better that a cell communicates with another cell, it's a very simplistic thought, but I think it's very accurate. The more, the, the better our cells are able to communicate and communicate properly, then the overall better the body does, including the immune system, which is so important for us. So for the, the layman, the person that didn't go to medical school like me, I avoided science and math and, <laughs> and, and chemistry and the things that were frustrating. I'm on the creative side. Help us envision a little bit how the immune system functions in our body. And, and here's why I'm asking. When I understand simple concepts, then it's easier for me to get past whatever the excuses are or the reasoning. And if I start to understand, then it makes it easier for me to adopt um, more healthy behaviors. changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, uh, I, I heard this asked in a little bit different way on another podcast. And I thought it was actually kind of a, I think it's a great question, actually, and I will answer it. They also asked, how do you know if your immune system is good? Um, you know, how do you know that? And, and I thought that that was a very interesting question. There is no real 
we certainly can do blood tests that tells us your immune system is, is very poor, uh, but we don't really have tests that say, oh, your immune system is fantastic, other than doing inflammatory markers and things of that nature. But the physician I was listening to, I thought hit its, you know, hit the nail on the head and is it's, it's all in how you feel. In other words, if you feel poor, if you, your energy is low, if you're sleeping bad, if you're sluggish, if you're tired, it is extremely unlikely that you have a good immune system because how you feel and your immune system are absolutely tied uh, together. And if you feel great and if your energy is great and you're sleeping great and you feel like your stress is low, there's an extremely high probability that your immune system is functioning properly. But going back to your actual question was, you know, kind of explain the immune system you know, most of our immune cells are produced in our thymus gland, which is a little gland that sits in our neck. And as we get older, the thym and, and not to be confused with the thyroid gland, although they are close together, but it's thymus gland. And that's why you will recommend you will recognize like thymusin alpha one or thymusin beta four, uh, mm -hmm. because those are ones that are produced and actually their function is to work on the thymus gland. But these, the thymus gland produces these T cells and B cells, and and these are our defense cells. These are our our warriors, if you want to call it like that. Whenever they recognize something that's not supposed to be there, they're the ones that's going to. I always like to tell my patients they're the ones that's going to capture them, imprison them, and kill them. Okay, yeah. uh, it, it is kind of how it works, or at least. Uh, protect the body the, the best it can against these things. The spleen also plays a role in uh, immune system. Um, and, and so, but again, as we start to get older, as our, when we're young, most of us can get away with nearly anything, in, in my opinion. You, know, you can get away with a bad diet. You can get away with not exercising. You can get away with not sleeping properly. And, and that's an exaggeration, so you can get away with anything, but you can get away with a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. And as we start to age, and that aging is different for everyone, but typically when we start entering the, the 30 plus uh, age range, um, and some of us more than others, uh, these bad habits start to um, um, build up, uh, build up upon us and start to show negative effects. The main place is in our immune system. Again, cellular function, cellular efficiency, cellular communication. Uh, we all go back to the cells and our immune system, uh, a proper immune system is, is many times going to be the make or break in how we feel. Um, so that's, that's kind of a long answer to that question, but I, I just thought that the other question was worthwhile talking about, you know, like, how do I know my immune system is good? Yeah, so th sometimes, though, we don't realize we're not feeling good. You know, sometimes you're in, you're in a bad mood, but you don't know it. Or we come, we become acclimated or used to how we feel is not the best. And it's shocking when you do improve that you didn't realize that. Yeah, and we deal with that all the time in our patients, especially with hormonal imbalance. And, and hormonal imbalance plays a crucial role into our immune system as well. But I'll get a lot of patients that maybe their spouse has them come in because they're, uh, you know, the spouse is our patient, the spouse feels better. It's many times the husband, the husband's like, I feel fine. You know, there's nothing <laughs> wrong. I mean, you got the, you got the uh, spouse in the corner behind them shaking their head. No, they don't. And, <laughs> so then, you, and then you get them feeling better. And they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize how good I felt or vice versa. People start to feel better, like let's say on hormonal replacement, nutrition and exercise. And then they kind of get complacent with how they feel and they forget how they felt and they'll fall off the wagon for a mm -hmm. month or two and they revert back to how they felt they're like, oh my gosh, I guess I did really feel tremendously worse. And, you know, I think all of us at some point, uh, as we do these um, changes in life, we revert a little bit, you know, for, um, we try to keep those to short periods of time, maybe a week mm -hmm. or two, hopefully not a month or two. Uh, yeah. but, but I've seen patients that fall off the wagon for a year or two and then they come yeah. back. Uh, so we all kind of have to learn as that goes. Well, it's, it's uh, frustrating when you, you know, you start to um, work on maybe losing some weight or something, but it's not, not immediate and you, you get a little discouraged, but if you really stopped and thought about it, you didn't gain all that weight in just a week or two. You gained that weight and your condition deteriorated over a long period of time. So it makes sense that it's going to take a long period of time to, to regain or get back to where you were, no? Yeah, and that's probably the biggest 
hill to climb with my patients is this thought that, you know, we're going to go from zero to a hundred in two weeks. You know, we're, I'm going to feel like I do today and I'm going to feel a hundred percent two weeks from now. And, and I think patients, when you bring it up to them kind of like that, they're like, Oh yeah, I get it. But you know, we're all kind of most of us, I think I am not well, actually, my wife would say, I definitely am. I want results immediately. You know, I want to do this. I want to feel better tomorrow. And um, like weight gain is probably one of the more, more common uh, discussions that I have with my patients. And I always tell them, you didn't gain it overnight. You're not losing it overnight. It's a whole lot more fun to gain it than it is to lose it. And most of the time for most of my patients, if they want to lose 15 to 20 plus pounds, we need to look at that as a nine to 18 month goal, not a three to nine month goal for most patients. Now I've, I've certainly had patients that can lose 15 or 20 pounds and that less than that, but it becomes quite painful if we want to do it like that. You know, we try to do a, a gradual steady weight loss so that we wake up in a year and everything is better. So we're talking about a gradual steady loss. And one of the things that has really been enlightening to me in these conversations, and I I naturally understood because of the marketing around uh, low testosterone, that as we age, we produce less testosterone. But as we age, we begin to produce le less of other things, many other things, peptides being one of them. But I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about aging as a disease and you have like A, you begin to have an increased oxidative state and mm -hmm. an increased catabolic state. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, aging is an actual disease now. It actually has its own ICD-10 code, which is the billing codes that insurance would <laughs> use. So aging is a disease. It's not just a term anymore. It's a real disease. <laughs> And that goes back to our pre previous discussion is why do we age? We age because of poor lifestyle habits. We age because, uh, or why do we age more rapidly? I guess let's put it that way. Why do we age more rapidly? Uh, because of uh, sometimes genetics plays a role, but poor exercise habits, poor nutritional habits, uh, um, and also cell senescence, stress and, and cellular inefficiency instead of cellular efficiency. Um, catabolic state is simply, you know, when we're younger, we're in a anabolic state. We're building the body. We're gaining muscle. We're gaining bone. We're, we're getting bigger, stronger, faster. And then we hit this phase to where we, our body starts to tear itself down. And that's a catabolic state. Uh, state. And so, uh, you know, like at my age, I'm about to, you know, I'm closing in on 50 fairly rapidly, 48 and a half. You know, we, I really want to watch my muscle mass. I want to make sure because I see so many patients that become worried about their muscle mass when they hit 60, 62. Well, it's really hard at that point to really, uh, you know, that's something we should have prepared for probably 10 years prior. Wow. Because I, I realized that it's probably not real realistic for me at 48 to, unless I really change my exercise routine and get really, uh, diligent and trying to add more muscle mass, I'm probably not going to add a ton more muscle mass at 48. So now it's about maintaining. Then it's about, you know, hopefully not starting to lose that muscle mass as long as I can, because as I tell my patients, what's the one thing that, that commonly um, that's not cancer, that's not a stroke or a heart attack that dramatically alters a pay, an elderly person's life, fall and fracture, you mm. know, uh, granny was, you know, her mom was out in the front yard and tripped on the water hose, fell down, broke her hip. Granny was never the same from that day on, mm -hmm. you know, and that's because of sarcopenia, a loss of muscle mass, along with osteopenia or osteoporosis, um, you know, so thinning bones, thinning muscles, if you want to look at it like that. Um, and, you know, oxidative stress, you know, that's simply the, the stress that our body is in, you know, that we've talked about a lot. We, it goes it goes right back to cellular efficiency and cellular communication. The better that we can do those things, the less oxidative stress we have in our bodies um, and, and, and the less, again, catabolic state is one of those things that that really just ties into our nutrition our exercise our hormones um, um, peptides um, all those things are just so important I, I kind of think of catabolic state and oxidative state kind of as one honestly so thinking about the things that we need as we age we're fighting against like a loss of appetite maybe a loss of uh, sleeping well 
Why are these so impactful in in the speed of our age? Um, yeah, our aging. Yeah, well, you know, those type of stresses, again, it's it kind of goes back to when we're younger, we can handle these stresses better. And as we get older, we don't handle them as well. And we're just not functioning as well, which causes dysfunction in other parts of the body, like people who say, and, and I struggle with sleep personally. It's one of those things that despite everything, it's gotten better, uh, but my sleep is nowhere what it, like it was eight to 10 years ago. And it's not, and I, the, the one thing I talk about with my patients who are in my age range and above that all seem to struggle with is sleep. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, getting good sleep. And I think it's really important for our patients to monitor their sleep. There's so many great uh, what technology ways now to monitor your sleep because so many people just say, well, I don't sleep good. Well, okay. How do you know that? Well, I feel tired and I wake up. Okay. Well, that's, you're probably right. But you know, one of the big things that people need to be screened for is sleep apnea. A lot of people have sleep, sleep apnea. They're stopping breathing in their sleep, which mm -hmm. uh, you will not get good sleep if you have sleep apnea. Um, but you know, I, I wear the aura ring, you know, the, 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 the NBA bubble, uh, everyone in the NBA bubble wears one of these and it monitors your temperature, your heart rate, your, your breathing patterns, your sleep cycles. And it's really informative for me to, um, to you know, monitor my sleep and see how it's changing and try to relate that back to things. Oh yeah, I did have a big meal right before I tried to go to bed or oh, you know what, I did have three or four beers last night an hour before I went to bed. Um, you know, another big thing is getting some sunlight, getting outside every day if we can and spending 30 minutes to an hour uh, with some good sunlight, uh, that helps sleep so much. Ketone esters before bed, um, you know, as we've talked about before, helps sleep. Loss of appetite, that's, you know, <laughs> I haven't had that one. Uh, I feel like my <laughs> goes up, not down. But a lot of people do it, especially our senior patients. They do struggle with. Um, I, I think two things kind of happens there is their appetite starts to go down, and as it starts to go down, they start snacking a lot and they start gravitating to worse foods, uh, things that they can grab and open and eat thing. I, I always say, try not to eat out of a bag or a box if you can help it. But as we get older, hmm. especially if it's just you and your spouse and you're both the same age, or maybe you're by yourself, uh, you start to grab those things that people just grab off the shelves. You know, cooking a full meal is a for one or two people who are going to eat eight bites doesn't seem worth it anymore. Uh, but I think that all goes back to simply keeping your health up. Um, as that catabolic state starts to kick in and get worse, I think that's when that appetite starts to really drop. Um, Cause you know, as you probably know, I've also dealt a lot with geriatrics and it's the common battle we have with the geriatrics is just getting them to eat. I mean it, because when you quit eating, truly quit eating like you're supposed to, life is over. Uh, it's just how long is it going to last? Um, you know, because your body has to have proper nutrition. I always tell my patients, we're kind of like cars, but we're not like we can only live so long without nutrition, but we don't have the option of just running out of gas. So our body will do lots of things to try to slow it down, try to prevent it. But the outcome will be the same. Um, you know, if you throw me on a desert island and I don't eat forever, I will eventually die from, you know, malnutrition. Um, and that's so much of what our elderly do. And as they're not eating properly, they're losing more bone. They're losing more muscle. It's just speeding that catabolic phase up. So uh, I just think in our age range and younger is when to fix this problem to hopefully avoid it as we get older. So what are some of the things that we can do to keep our health up and also complement or support our immune system as we get into this time when we're going to see a lot of people fighting colds, feeling, yeah, you know, feeling crampy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's been kind of not, not, I don't know if you, I, I was going to use the word funny is, is that, <laughs> you know, now with COVID uh, somehow we've forgotten that we can get everything else too. You know, because <laughs> everything is COVID until proven otherwise, uh, you know, like, Oh, my stomach hurts COVID. Oh, my throat hurts COVID. And uh, it's just, it's just crazy now how, Everything is COVID until proven otherwise. And allergies have been extremely bad for most Texans uh, in the last month. 
I know my family has suffered from it a lot. I've suffered a lot from it. Um, the one thing I found interesting is, is they're, pre they're starting to change their attitude about the flu season and starting to think the flu, this flu season, although we need to prepare and although we need to do the things that we're about to talk about, might be uh, a little bit uh, less severe than in the past. And that's because we're all, well, all of us, a lot of us, if you're following the rules, you're lowering your chance of getting the flu mm -hmm. because we're social distancing. We're wearing masks. We're, you know, um, if we don't feel good, we're staying home. So you're, um, you're less likely to give it to your, your whole, uh, office building full of people. And so I've heard a lot of the, uh, infectious disease specialists now really predicting they're feeling like, you know, hopefully that this is going to be a little bit easier flu season. But I think as we enter the flu season, all it does is, is reinforce what we should have already been doing. And that is, and really um, I heard Dr. Seed say this the other day, and I thought it was a really profound statement. Let's at least learn one thing from the, uh, from this pandemic. Let's take care of our immune system all the time not just when there's a pandemic, right. um, you know, because it's something that if we do 365 days uh, a year uh, for the next, hopefully many years, uh, we're going to be uh, so much healthier at the end of this versus if we didn't do this. So, you know, the immune system is one of those things that many of these things are so simple. There's such a multitude of things that you can do for your immune system. Um, and, and I'm just going to kind of, rattle off a few of them, but huge fan of intermittent fasting. I think it is crucial for our immune system. Again, 16 straight hours of no calorie intake except for water, black coffee, or uh, unsweet tea. Uh, or in my case, I do drink Rooster Booster Light, which is a, a cute <laughs> tea, a local uh, energy drink. I have to admit to that. Uh, my staff would say I was lying if I didn't say that, but it's got it doesn't have aspartame in it. So I don't like aspartame products, uh, but a calorie free, not diet Coke, not diet soda, uh, 16 hours, uh, nothing, no, nothing nutritionally or, or calories wise. And, you know, that's going to really send that in, drive those insulin levels down, uh, which is going to help use uh, mobilize fat cells for, um, for fuel. Um, it's going to be more efficient for cell efficiency. Um, and it's going to help your immune. It's not only going to make you feel better because uh, it does. It's not only going to make you burn fat cells, which I always joke, most of us have a few extra of those to burn. So that's good weight loss from fat loss. And it's also going to boost the immune system. So huge fan costs nothing actually saves you money because you're eating less. Okay. So that, that would be my first thing. Um, proper um, exercise routines. I, I think that all of us should have at least three to four workouts a week. Um, I think that needs to be a combination of uh, now, again, as long as you can tolerate these things, but hit, you already got it up there, hit work <laughs> it out. So you know what I was going to say? So high intensity interval training workouts, um, you know, so getting that that heart rate up as high as you can stand it safely uh, for 20 seconds, bringing it down for 10, up for 20, down for 10. Um, you can do as little as four minutes of that and get a tremendous response from your metabolism and your immune system. Um, and then I think as for, I always kind of think of everybody in my age range. So I'm going to say, even though I'm upper forties, I'm going to say like 35 and up, we need to really be thinking about our um, resistance training as well. Again, we don't, we don't want, we do not want to get ourselves into that sarcopenic uh, phase where we don't have enough muscle mass down the road, getting, keeping those bones nice and strong. Um, so exercise and nutrition, extremely important. Uh, hormonal balance. Um, so, you know, if you if you're low on energy, not feeling good, feel like you're in a mental fog, uh, feeling like, um, you know, one of the things we always say, feeling like your best is behind you instead of in front of you. Uh, that's always a good time to get your hormones checked uh, by a qualified provider. Um, I highly recommend bioidentical hormones over synthetic. Um, if you're, if you are a candidate, if you do look like you need hormone replacement, I would, I would absolutely recommend instituting proper hormone replacement for your immune system, as well as a multitude of other things. Um, talk, to, talk, to, talk, to, talk to us more about the bioidentical hormones. I thought they were only synthetic and that they're very, uh, there's just not a lot of, good parts of that is kind of like you're in this situation where you got to take these hormones, but there's these effects, side effects, but tell us more about the bioidentical versions. Yeah. So, um, 
the webinar I was part of earlier in the week, actually, that was really what the point of the, the webinar was. And that is, is so many people have thrown hormone replacement completely under the bus because of that study that came back, came out, gosh, 12 years or so ago now, maybe 15 years ago, that said that uh, women were at higher risk if they use estrogen for strokes, heart attacks, and breast cancer. Yeah. And, and so it just had this blanket feel of to physicians, a lot of physicians, not all physicians. And I actually had this feeling at the time. I totally backed away from hormone replacement. I stayed away from it for about four or five years mm -hmm. until my own hormones started to deplete. And then I started changing my opinion on it. <laughs> um, but what they did learn from that study was, is that that study was based on Primin and Primpro, which is the uh, equine estrogen um, um, study. And because the most commonly prescribed form of estrogen in women is still Primarin. Uh, Primarin is, uh, they collect mare urine and, you know, uh, take out the, uh, spin out the estrogen and then put it in a capsule and boom, there goes your uh, horse uh, estrogen that you take. Wow. And that, that is not bioidentical. It is similar enough that it binds the receptors in your body and it will uh, give you some of the good effects such as vaginal dryness going away, uh, the effect on the uh, skin. Uh, hot flashes going away. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't, um, it has too many side effects. So when you're using bioidentical hormones, uh, bioidentical simply means biologic, it's plant based, and it's 100% identical to what is in your body already, or at least should be in your body already. Mm -hmm. And so as I tell my ladies, when I talk to them about this, I go, and studies have proven this. Okay, so you had estrogen in your body for 48 to 52 years. That's the average age of menopause. Okay. So let's just say 50. Mm -hmm. You had estrogen in your body for 50 years. At 50 years old, you quit making it. And I gave it back to you exactly like what you had in your body. But now I'm going to cause cancer. Um, how does that, how, how can your body tell if it's 100% bioidentical? And the truth is it doesn't. Actually, we believe it lowers your chance of cancer. Wow. And, and so, um, and the same way with testosterone, I just feel like, you know, and I've personally been on synthetic testosterone testosterone for many years, I will tell you, I uh, feel so much better with bioidentical testosterone than I do with synthetic testosterone. And we could debate that for hours. Um, a hormonal pellets is, is, is bioidentical testosterone versus uh, synthetic injectable. Uh, all, all injectable testosterone is um, um, synthetic. And so, you know, I just, I, I see higher incidences of side effect with injectable testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do prescribe it. Uh, I'm not going to claim I don't because I have patients that come in and are like, I'm not, I'm only going to do a shot. Um, I will not prescribe those synthetic estrogen. Um, I, I feel like with synthetic testosterone, I might be causing some side effects, but we can manage it. Uh, with synthetic estrogen, I feel like I might be truly harming my patient and I simply won't do that. Okay. So we, um, we talked about the hormones, the intermittent fasting, some exercising. These are all things to help our cells communicate better and have energy. So now what are some of the other things that we might want to consider that we weren't aware of? So um, ketone esters, as we've talked about before, I'm a huge fan of ketone esters, uh, you know, five to 10 cc's once to twice a day, um, really uh, just overall helps with your overall health. But what it really does is helps the cells communicate properly. It actually, um, I had it described, I heard it described last week this way. It is instant fuel for the cells uh, mm -hmm. because our, our cells, um, you know, basically, um, can only use glucose or fatty acids or proteins for uh, source energy. Of fuel for energy, and it actually prefers like a ketone ester is the best type of fuel that it can have. And so there's nothing to impede it. It's immediate absorption. And so your cells have the immediate fuel that they need to, to work properly. Um, and not in addition to that, you also get the, uh, and I certainly can feel this, but the improvement in uh, brain function, uh, just feeling like the, the brain fog clears and it's a really rapid effect. And then, you know, that's not even going into the, uh, uh, ketogenic state that we're going into for just a few hours to burn more fat cells to increase our overall athletic performance. So uh, I have, I struggle to describe to someone as a layman what ketone esters are and how do you take them? Can you like help me out? Give me some good words. Yeah. So I actually, 
I, I've kind of struggled with that as well. And, <laughs> you know, uh, it's kind of funny you say that. And so that's why I've been watching more and more because it's one of those things like I know it works and I feel it, but how do I describe it to patients? And, and, and actually I heard somebody say this, um, uh, maybe it was off the ketone aid website, but it's actually a food. Uh, you know, you need to think of it as a food for your body. Mm -hmm. Um, don't really think of it as a, it's certainly not a medicine. I don't even know if I think of it as a supplement. I would think of it as a food product, although it doesn't break your fast. So that's the good news there. Okay. And, and just mm -hmm. think of it as a food product that, 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 um, cause most people these days, when you talk about ketogenesis, they at least have an idea of what you're talking about with ketones within the body. And I actually, I think I had it written down. I was making notes, 10 cc's equals one millimole of ketones in the body. What's and a millimole? It's a very small amount, but it's just enough. <laughs> it's just enough to create that ketogenic state that we're looking for. Um, and so we're not putting ourselves into a nutritional ketogenic state, which is where we deprive the body of carbohydrates to the point that our body starts making ketones. Um, because as we have, we talked about before, there can be some real negatives in my opinion with that. Uh, gallstones, kidney stones go up dramatically with ketogenic state, uh, uh, extended ketogenic states, N not for a day or two, but for weeks on end. Um, and I've just had too many patients. Uh, the constipation can be quite severe with it and which also equals your, your gut health, which your gut health is your immune system again. And so mm -hmm. we get a circular pattern, but when we use it, it, it's like you and I always talk about it a lot of things are great in small bursts, but if we overdo it, then we're not, we're going to, we're not going to get the effects we're going to want. And we're going to start to get more side effects. Heck it's like testosterone. I tell my guys the right amount of testosterone is great, but there is a level that is enough. And then you go above it and that's when you start to cause problems. It's, it's kind of like that everywhere in life. Everything in moderation is, is, is what's best for the most part. Uh, even exercise, you can exercise too much. And we've mm -hmm. talked about that. Many of the common problems you see in high end athletes is over exercising. And it's really hard to tell an athlete, you need to take a day off. Yeah. Uh, you know, every, you know, maybe every third day, every fourth day, take it off. Don't exercise at all. I'm like, what? I mean, you know, I, I see that all the time with people my age and they're trying to get in shape and they're exercising seven days a week two hours a clip. And I'm like, you can't do that. I mean, you just can't, you're breaking your body down, causing more problems than good. Um, and, and so um, that's kind of how I explain the ketone esters to my patients. And then the, the other thing I would say is, is, you know, and, and I'm a huge fan of this. It's very, very cheap baking soda, sodium bicarb. Um, so I'd like to kind of expound upon a little bit on sodium bicarb, Alka-Seltzer Gold. There you go. So Alka-Seltzer Gold is nothing more than baking soda, um, not Alka-Seltzer. Make sure we're clear. Alka-Seltzer mm -hmm. Gold. Only can get it on Amazon as far as I know. Uh, it's just simply a clean way of getting your sodium bicarb. You know, otherwise you got the baking soda box, you got a teaspoon, you're trying to put the teaspoon of water, trying to get it to dissolve. It goes everywhere. Uh, I just think Alka-Seltzer Gold is so easy to do. open up the package, throw a couple in bottled water, drink it down. Uh, you can do that once or twice a day and, and you'll get an, an amazing effect from that. Um, but, you know, some of the things that that um, it does is so like the the SARS-CoV two virus, the, the COVID-19 virus, um, how it basically works is it has a spike protein that attaches to the ACE2 receptor on our cells. And then basically our body will bring that um, virus in and try to encapsulate it and try to get rid of it, basically. Um, and the COVID virus, like all viruses, prefers an acidic environment within the cell. And so the more acidic it is, the more uh, adapt the, 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 that is the breeding grounds for what that virus wants. And so sodium bicarb is a simple way to try to make that cellular uh, material a little bit more basic so that it's not as fruitful of a breeding ground for the virus as it would be otherwise. That's one of the simple things that you can kind of, you know, look at with uh, sodium bicarb. And then the other thing I was reading about or 
maybe I heard it uh, from Dr. Seeds, one of his lectures is, is that uh, just simple vitamin D absorption uh, mm -hmm. is dramatically improved with sodium bicarb. Uh, most people think they just take vitamin D and everything's great. And for a lot of us, that is the case. But glutathione is kind of the driving force of vitamin D absorption and um, sodium bicarb helps that process uh, move along down the pathway. And so sodium bicarb is, is really good for that. But, you know, sodium bicarb is just overall a really good product for homeostasis of the cells. So again, that, that proper communication and efficiency. And as I was doing our research, you know, they, the Spanish flu uh, back around the turn of the 90s. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, um, sodium bicarb was one of their major treatments for um, the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that's been around a really long time. I know that there's a lot, I hear a lot of providers out there saying, oh, it's an old wives tale. Uh, it's really not. Um, it, it can be a very uh, a potent um, product to use for boosting your immune system and, and protecting yourself against viral and bacterial and fungal infections. I'm certainly not saying, you know, treat COVID with nothing but sodium bicarb, but it's a very helpful addition that everybody practically has at their house, you know, somewhere. So yeah. making soda, if you don't want to buy Alka-Seltzer gold, it costs a few cents. And, you know, you can actually use it if you, if you do have an acute infection, you can use it every two to four hours, half a teaspoon every two to four hours uh, while awake. Um, you know, so I just think it's a, a really important addition um, to add to your regimen if you if you can. Yeah, I was I was about to say the 1918 thing, but they um, they use that for flus. They use it for colds, infections, sort not of. just yeah mm -hmm. so allergies. Mm -hmm. Allergies, yeah. Yeah, amazing. I think you should, and I think you still should be actually, <laughs> you know, uh, still use our antihistamines and our, uh, and our, and our steroid nasal sprays, but you know, it's just, you know, because I, I think one of the important things to think about is, is, is there's, um, you know, there's, um, two major forms of our immune system, the innate and the adaptive phase. And that innate phase is that first phase. It's that, it's that basically that phase where we have a very fast reaction. It's actually like when you get sick and you run a fever and you get shakes and you get chills, uh, that's inflammation from the infection entering your cellular level. Um, and you know, that's the innate immune system. And, and believe it or not, th that's kind of why they talk about a little bit about like, early on uh, about why not to take Motrin and um, um, any of the NSAIDs. If you remember, that was a big deal uh, originally with COVID and it. And they've kind of backed off that a bit. But if you really think about it, if you really, really kind of think through that, why is that important? Why would I not want to do that? Because you're really not wanting to blunt the innate immune system, the innate immune system. There's a reason why uh, the, the temperature is going up. There's a reason why you're feeling achy and chills and things of that nature. And, and it's not that you can't take low doses of those things to kind of just help you get through the symptoms, but that's your body fighting. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, that is part of the uh, process, and that's where that cellular efficiency gets so important, and that's where the sodium bicarb really comes into play. Um, and, and so I just think it's, you know, I'm always trying to tie it back into, you know, cell, cellular efficiency because that's what I truly believe in. And then the adaptive phase? Yeah, so the adaptive phase is the more long-term phase, I guess you will say. Um, and, and so that comes later. Um, and, and it's extremely important too. Um, it's where your antibodies are produced and you get more of that long-term um, uh, immunity to things. Um, and so um, ex just as important as the innate, but the innate is, is what we feel. It's what we, when we know we're sick. So what are some of the, the peptides that we don't know about that we would consider that would be a great a great thing to talk to our uh, physician or our, our um, provider or if i'm a physician or a provider myself what are some of the things that we could start maybe can suggesting to our patients 
Well, I, the first and foremost is thymus and alpha one. Um, it, it's it, it, during this time, it's, it's a crucial peptide. If we're going to use a peptide, I think if there's only one peptide that a practitioner is going to use for uh, modulating the immune system. So we're not trying to up, we're not trying to make the immune system work harder. We're trying to make it work better. Uh, we're trying to get the thymus gland to produce more of these T cells that we need to fight infections. And we're trying to get the current T cells to function better. We're not, we don't want to overstress our immune system. You know, that's one of those things. If we kind of like a car, if we run it at 9,000 RPM, uh, you know, for the next two hours, we're probably going to have a bad outcome. And so we, we just want to have that immune system functioning properly. Thymus and alpha one is, is, you know, produced in the thymus gland and that's exactly what it does. It, it causes us to make more T cells. It causes us to have a better function of those T cells and B cells and just overall immune function uh, has been used extensively for many years. They actually studied it uh, in what was it? 2002 in China, they had the first SARS outbreak, SARS CoV-1. Um, and that's actually a lot of the data that's coming out now with SARS CoV-2, COVID-19 is actually based on those studies that they did in 2002. The good thing about the 2002 stuff was is that that SARS virus was not nearly as infectious as this SARS virus was, but they were similar in their effects on the body. They actually had about a 10% death rate with SARS-CoV-1, but it just only infected, I think, 80,000 or so people. Um, but they, one of the major peptides that they studied uh, in China was thymus and alpha one, and they saw significant improvements. And they've actually now had studies out of Italy and China in in thymus and alpha one with SARS CoV two, uh, our current coronavirus vaccine uh, or vaccine uh, infection um, virus. Um, and they've actually shown a 33% reduction in mortality rate in severe COVID patients. So these are patients wow. that are, are in the ICU, possibly on a ventilator, and it's kind of touch or go if they're going to make it simply by adding in thymus and alpha one, they've seen a 33% reduction in mortality. There was actually an article that I think is worth discussing that came out last week by NPR, uh, basically blasting physicians for prescribing thymus and alpha one. And I could not disagree with this article any more uh, <laughs> strongly. And it was a very, very biased article. And it basically said, how, how dare uh, physicians try things that aren't 100% FDA approved? Um, you know, <laughs> th th if it's not FDA approved, it can't work. And it's such a ridiculous statement, that, a stance that NPR took. Um, and, you know, it simply works. I hate to interrupt, but the, the, absurd is, the absurdity of that statement, thymus and alpha-1, your body produces. This is just a bioidentical version of what your body produces that needs a little supplemental juice, right? Yeah, I mean, it was just a, it was a very biased article. I, I'm, you know, I don't know who was behind it, but it, it just and they picked on some poor doctor that made some <laughs> statements that maybe were, uh, you know, maybe her statements were a little strong, but they actually went after her in this article, and you know, she did some statements apologizing for making. And I'm just like, my gosh. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I believe healthcare should between between the should be between the provider and the patient. And mm -hmm. I just, it really got under my skin, that article that um, that we saw, uh, I think it was last Thursday or Friday when it came out. Uh, anyway, I, I, I digress on that one. Um, <laughs> great peptide. Uh, it's the one that I would uh, like the most. Uh, there is another peptide that's really good that's called LL37. Uh, I like LL37 a lot in, um, um, you can possibly use it in patients that have uh, been exposed to um, a viral infection. Um, it's a, um, you know, it's a, again, it's a catholethicin, say that 10 times, but, um, uh, and, oh, and that's another thing about bicarb, going back to that, um, catholethicins are natural peptides that we have in our body that are antiviral, antibacterial. Sodium bicarb helps upregulate that system as well. What so that's just enough, uh, upregulates the catholethicin uh, peptide stream. And so that's just another reason why sodium bicarb, it will naturally increase your LL37 within your body. Uh, of course, we can supplement LL37 as a peptide. Um, I've used it a few times. Really, to be honest with you, thymus and alpha-1 is my main 
player when it comes to the immune system. Uh, TB4 would be another really good one, thymosin beta-4, um, and we many times will rotate that one in or out. Thymosin alpha-1 for the providers out there is one that I, I simply use it all the time. Uh, 0.5 cc's twice a week if we're not in an infectious state, um, and then we can rotate in the TB4 um, for a month or two at a time, for a round or two at a time, and then bring it back every three to six months. Uh, a really, really good peptide. Uh, there's a few others, but I think that for uh, the patients and the providers out there, that's the three that I would probably concentrate on. Yeah, so we, we do want to emphasize that the reason that we're having these conversations is to help educate folks that there are other options. This is not medical advice that we're giving. This is for educational purposes and that you should consult your, your provider and ask them. We just want to empower you with the information to help you ask better to have the words to use. Yeah, and and, and there is momentum building in the United States with peptides. Um, there, the, the 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 physician, the provider, um, the amount of providers signing up to learn about uh, peptides is growing at a rapid pace. I really, really believe that in two to five years, when you talk about peptides, it'll be like talking about testosterone today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the testosterone really has just skyrocketed the discussion, the educational aspects of it over the last five years. And I think that's exactly what you're going to see with peptides over the next two to five years. And, and we're all familiar with peptides already because of the word insulin. Correct. And like we always say, we have over 7,000 naturally occurring peptides in our body at the moment. And these, I, what I was uh, really, uh, I don't, I don't know why, but it impressed me that these have been around in animal health. Um, veterinarians have been prescribing this for animals, for racehorses, for example. Um, have you ever wondered why these pro athletes they'll get injured, and it's something that if it happened to me or you, it, it'd take us like a year to get over, and those guys are back. Mm -hmm. in, in the game in just weeks, mm -hmm. it's because of these peptides. Well, and, and I think some of that is, is obviously these high-end athletes. Um, like I always tell my guys, because I have a handful of former professional athletes in my practice, and I truly believe that these professional athletes, a guy that used to could hit, you know, 20 home runs a year with consistent basis, probably had a much higher growth hormone and testosterone level than uh, – you know, an overweight guy who's the same age. Um, and then as they age, those things start to fall. But as you have those higher growth hormone levels and testosterone levels, naturally, you're going to heal faster and better. And then, of course, there's a lot of guys that will turn to some of these sports enhancing uh, products that are out there, whether they are supposed to or not. Um, you know, we've heard lots of stories about that. But um, I, there's a there is a big movement like Mark Cuban is one of the big proponents of growth hormone and athletes because uh, I, from listening to him, he's seen the positive effects that it has. And, you know, I'm not necessarily a growth hormone. Uh, uh, I'm not necessarily 100% in favor of growth hormone, but why shouldn't an athlete be able to use maybe a little bit of CJ, morellin if they have a true uh, injury that this is going to help them heal faster and better? Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I think as peptides again become more norm, you're going to start to see a lot of these different organizations starting to uh, actually truly allow some of these different products for certain conditions like healing and things of that nature. So would BPC-157 be something that you could have an expectation that it's helping your immune system? It certainly is. It's helping through cell senescence. It is uh, BPC is that all around peptide that is just fantastic. Um, and a lot of times my patients are like, hey, I just want to, you know, I'm already doing hormone replacement. I'm exercising. I'm eating pretty well. Um, I really don't want to have a complicated regimen. What's something that's really simple that's going to kind of give me the most bang for the buck? TA1.5 cc's twice a week subcutaneously and BPC oral two pills a day, uh, two capsules a day, excuse me. And, and now that we've talked about how the BPC is over the counter, mm -hmm. uh, it's a really easy, uh, not horrifically cost, in, you know, um, uh, regimen um, that really works well uh, overall for the immune system, cellular efficiency, cell senescence, and all those good things we like to talk about. All right. So how can we improve our immune system? Well, here's this one, intermittent fasting, doing some exercise, improve your diet a little bit, 
check on your hormones. Let's get some sleep. Let's um, maybe some de-stress uh, a little bit. Yep. Let's get some Alka-Seltzer Gold going. Maybe some ketone esters. It's just a little food, just a little food for your cells. And then if your provider is open to it, then maybe you can consider thymosin alpha one and uh, the TB4, the LL37. And one thing just real quick um, on the diet, I really should have probably hammered it home a little harder is, is keep it, <laughs> keeping your sugar content down. Um, you know, these hyperglycemic uh, diets that so many Americans live by, high carb, high glycemic diets are really counterproductive uh, for overall health, your immune system, and just generally how you feel. And so certainly not everyone should eat the same diet. I, I recognize that. But most of my patients, if they would simply limit five foods in their diet, diet, uh, they'll do extremely better besides the common sense stuff of don't eat cake pies and drink Cokes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that is uh, bread, rice, pasta, corn, and potatoes. If you can limit those five white foods in your diet, you will feel so much better. And I never tell my patients to um, take them completely out of their diet. I just say limit them in your diet. Dip from that group two to four times a week, not two to three times a day. A day. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you're getting a lot from these uh, these episodes or these uh, weekly conversations, please give us a like. Be sure to subscribe, and you can reach out to uh, Dr. Chris here at the Research Clinic www.theresearchclinic.com. And um, if you've got a physician that you think uh, ought to talk to Dr. Chris, let's do it. These peptides are a good thing for most people in a lot of situations. Dr. Chris, is there anything you want to wrap up with? No, I think we covered a, a lot of ground today. I appreciate your time. Yeah, it's really good. So next week, we're taking a hiatus. Dr. Chris is going to go and get some more education on peptides and come back and share it with us the following week. And if I can get my act together, might run a rerun next week at this time. So <laughs> let's cross our fingers. All right. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Thanks, Steve. Have a great day. Yeah, all right.